biology. So let's now look at biology paper three, form three, uh, paper. So the first question is asking, you are provided with food sample label D in solution form. Using the reagents provided, carry out tests to identify the food substances in the food sample. So, and then we have been given a table there to fill the table. So, the table contains proteins, contains non reducing sugar, and then it also contains starch. So, this practical question was testing on the knowledge that we studied in Form 1 of food test. So, we have been given the different reagents, which are hydrochloric acid, we have sodium hydroxide, we have iodine, we have calcium sulfate to do the different food tests and write the conclusion and the results. So, for the proteins, first of all, we'll say, Put 2 ml of food sample in a clean test tube. Then after doing that, we add sodium hydroxide solution. So we add about 1 ml of sodium hydroxide solution. So after adding about 1 ml of sodium hydroxide solution, we add also about 1 ml of copper 2 sulfate solution. So that is the procedure that you are going to make in the protein. So apart from that, we now go to now the observations. So the observations in this case now. The observation was that there was no color change or the blue color of copper 2 oxide persisted. So that blue color of copper 2, ox uh, of copper 2 sulfate rather did not change. So the blue color of copper 2 sulfate persisted or did not change. So for the conclusion, we are going to say that the proteins are absent. Because for us to know that the proteins are present, the blue color of copper 2 sulfate should change color from blue to purple. But in this case, since now the color of copper 2 sulfate remained blue in color, so we are going to say that uh, we are going to say that protein was absent. So now apart from that, the next one was testing for non-reducing sugar with the reagents that we have. So that is the test, testing for non-reducing sugar. So for this test of non-reducing sugar, we can say that put 2 centimeters cubed or 2 ml of the food sample D in a clean test tube. So after that, you can say that add 2 centimeters cubed of hydrochloric acid. So why are we adding hydrochloric acid? We are adding hydrochloric acid in order to, to hydrolyze or break down the disaccharide to different monosaccharides. A topic we studied, a subtopic we studied in the Form 1, the topic of nutrition in plants and animals. So whereby you say that if we, had, if we add dilute hydrochloric acid to a disaccharide, so the dilute hydrochloric acid is going to break down or hydrolyze the disaccharide to many monosaccharides. So in this case, that is why we are adding hydrochloric acid. So add 2 ml of hydrochloric acid, then after doing this, so you take the hydrochloric acid and place it in a warm or a hot water bath. So why do we place it in a warm or a hot water bath? so that the heat acts as a catalyst which speeds up the rate of the disaccharide being broken down to different monosaccharides for testing if this is a reducing sugar or a non-reducing sugar. So, uh, so after that, we take or we extract the, the test tube containing the contents of solution D and then we add about 2 centimeters cubed of sodium hydrogen carbonate. But some books say you add sodium hydrogen carbonate until fizzing stops, which is also correct. So why is this fizzing coming about? Or why is it that when we add sodium hydrogen carbonate, there is possible fizzing? So this fizzing is as a result of carbon dioxide escaping from the reaction. Because remember in chemistry we say that when a metal carbonate reacts with an acid, there is the evolution of carbon dioxide. So the reason as to why this fizzing is coming out is because carbon four oxide from the sodium hydrogen carbonate is the one which is escaping. As this carbon four oxide is escaping, it is leading to that fizzing observation. So after extracting this test tube from the hot water bath, so we add sodium hydrogen carbonate until fizzing stops. So after doing that, the last step is that we add Benedict solution to the contents in the test tube and then make observation. So like according to this case, the color of Benedict solution changed color from blue to green. After green, it changed color to yellow. After yellow, it settled at brown color. So that was the observation. So the color of Benedict was from blue. It changed to green, then green, yellow. And then after yellow, finally, it settled at brown. So what observations could be made in this specific practical experiment? 
So the observation you are to say that non-reducing sugar is present. It is wrong for you to say non-reducing sugars are present. You should say non-reducing sugar present. And that is it. That's how you give that answer. So the last part of the table was testing for starch. So for this testing for starch, we always begin with putting the food substance in the test tube. So again here we're going to say put about 2 centimeters cubed of solution or sample D in a clean test tube and then add few drops. Okay, we can say not few because in practical it must be specific and then say add 2 drops of iodine solution and then finally make observation. So put 2 centimeters cubed of food substance in a clean test tube then add 2 drops of iodine solution and then make observation. So according to this case, the color of iodine changed color from brown to blue-black. So since it changed color from brown to blue-black, that indicated that starch was present. And that is the conclusion or the results that you give. Starch is present. So for these color changes, also for Benedict solution, for copper 2 sulfate solution and for brown iodine solution, you must identify the initial color and then finally the final color. Don't just say that iodine changed color to brown or the food substance changed color to brown. It is not the food sub substance which is changing color, but it is iodine which is changing color. So never just say that it changed color. So you must identify the initial color and then finally the final color. And that's why for the iodine you say that the brown color of iodine changed color from brown to blue black. For Benedict solution, we say that the, the blue color of Benedict solution changed to green, yellow, and then to brown. For copper 2 sulfate, we say that the blue color of copper 2 sulfate persisted, or the blue color of copper 2 sulfate did not change. So that is now how you make these inferences in, in biology or in chemistry. You must identify the initial color and then finally we identify the final color for you to get everything correct. So question number two is asking, is saying, you are provided with specimen labeled F. Examine it carefully and answer the question that follows. Yeah, if I'm not wrong, yeah. So you are provided with specimen labeled E. Examine it and answer the questions that follow in this case. So this specimen labeled E was a flower which had at least a leaf uh, attached to it. So are provided with the specimen labeled E. Examine it and answer the question that follow. So as you can look at that specimen, that is the specimen that you are given. So I've been told to examine this specimen and then we answer the question that follow. So the first part of the question is asking, Roman 1, name the class of the plant from which the specimen was obtained. So name the class of the plant from which the specimen was obtained. So remember we have two classes of plants, that is class monocotyledonae and then also class dicotyledonae. And as you can look at this leaf, so this leaf has network veins. So automatically, if it has network veins and a petiole, that is from a dicotyledonous plant, and therefore, it is from a dicotyledonae class. So that is the class to which this organism, uh, the specimen belongs. It is from class dicotyledonae. Roman 2 is asking, using obser observable features only, Name three reasons for your answer in Roman 1 above. So using the observable, observable features, name three reasons for your answer above. So the first one we have said, it has network venation. Apart from network venation, we can see that it has a petiole or a leaf stalk. It is only dicotyledonous plants which have a leaf stalk. The monocotyledonous, they have a sheath, which is just a part of the leaf attached to the stem. For the dicots, they have a stalk, which attaches the leaf now to the stem. And also you can see that the leaf is very broad because for most monocotyledonous plants, their leaves are very narrow. So they are very thin and narrow. So since this leaf is broad, we can conclude that this one is from a dicotyledonous plant and not a monocotyledonous plant. So the next, which is Roman 3, is asking, name the agent of pollination for the flower of specimen E. So the agent of pollination. So remember the agents of pollination, we have water, we have wind, we have insects, we have humans or animals. So the insects are among the animals. So we have those three agents of population, water, wind and animals. So question is asking, name the agent of pollination for the flowers of specimen E. 
So if you can look at this flower, the flower is brightly colored, it is large. So due to these things, you can conclude that the agent of pollination for this specimen is insects because insects are attracted to brightly colored petals which are also very large. So the agents of pollination in this case again, the answer is insects. So Roman 4 is asking, state four observations of the specimen E that support your answer, the answer we have given previously. So by the observation, why did we say that this one is pollinated by insects and not water and not wind? So for the first thing we can say is that we can see that they have brightly colored petals in order to attract the insects. Apart from that, you can say that they are large and conspicuous. So since they are large and conspicuous, that also supports that they are insect pollinated. Apart from that, you can see that most of these flowers are scented. So since most of them are scented, that can also be an answer here. Because that scent is able to attract the insects for the process of pollination. So apart from that, you can say that they also have a landing platform on their stigma. Yeah, so they also have a landing platform on the pistil so that uh, like after insects have acquired the pollen grains, if they land on the stigma, they can be able to facilitate the process of pollination. And apart from that, lastly, you can say that the anthers are firmly attached to the filament. So since the anthers are firmly attached to the filament, therefore that also supports that it is insect pollinated flower. So Roman 5... Uh, Roman 5 is asking, draw and label the pistil of specimen E. So remember, the pistil is the female part of the flower. The stamen is the male part of the flower. Com so the stamen comprises of the pollen grains, the anther, the filament. While the pistil comprises of the stigma, style, and the ovary. So now this question is asking, draw and label the pistil of specimen E. So the other name of pistil, remember we studied in reproduction, we say that the other name of pistil is the genoasium. The other name of the stamen is the androasium. So in this question, you can say draw the pistil of specimen E or draw the genoasium of specimen E. And as you can look at that diagram, that is the only part the question is asking. We only draw the pistil. If you include anything of the male in this diagram, everything becomes wrong. Because the question is only asking for the pistil and nothing of the male to show up there. And that is what you give as your answer. And then we now go to question number three. So question number three is asking, the photographs below represent different types of animals. Study them carefully and answer the question that follow. So we have, as you can see, we have specimen KM, specimen N, and specimen O that you have been given. So K, M, N, and O are the specimen given. And then the first part of the question is asking, state two observable differences between K and M. So what are the two observable differences between specimen K and specimen N? So for the specimen K, first of all, you can see that specimen K looks more of an insect. Specimen M looks more of um, an arachnid, most likely an arachnid, which is a tick, a mite, etc. So, in short, it's like we're giving a differences between insects and arachnids. That is what happens. So, class insecta and class arachnida. So, for the specimen K, we can say that it has three pairs of legs, as you can see. And then for the specimen N, we can see that it has at least four pairs of legs. So, apart from that, for insect in class insecta, we can see that it is bodies divided into three body parts. While for this other one, you can see that it is bodies, its body is divided into two body parts, which is the head and the cephalothorax. So, the cephalothorax means that the thorax and the abdomen are fused together. So, since the thorax and the abdomen are fused together, now this is called a cephalothorax. For the insecta class, so you can see that these organisms have a head separate, thorax separate, abdomen separate. But for the class arachnida organisms like specimen N, we can see that the thorax and the abdomen are attached. So if they are attached, this is called a cephalothorax. So apart from that, you can see that specimen K has wings. So it possesses wings, while specimen M, they do not have wings. So they lack wings. Apart from that, you can see that specimen K has a pair of antennae, while specimen M does not have an antennae. So they lack antennae altogether. 
So question C is asking, classify the specimen M following into the following taxa giving reason in each case. So we classify specimen M into following taxa. So taxa is from taxonomic units. Remember we have kingdom, phylum, division, class, order, family, genus, and species. So if we are only talking about kingdom, that is a taxon. If we are only talking about phylum, that is a taxon. If we only talk about class, if we only talk about species, that is a taxon. But if we mention two or more taxons, that is now taxa. So taxa is the pl plural of taxon. So if you only talk about kingdom, that is a taxon. If you talk about kingdom and phylum or division, that is now taxa. So remember that the difference between taxon and taxa, because both of them are found in taxonomy, which is the science or study of classification. So in our case, the first one is phylum. So we classify M according to its phylum. So it is found in phylum arthropoda. So remember for organisms in phylum arthropoda, we say that phylum arthropoda is the phylum whereby we have different classes under phylum arthropoda, just to mention a few. We have class Arachnida, we have class Chilopoda, comprising of the centipedes, and class Diplopoda, comprising of the millipedes, etc. So for the phylum, again, remember we have two main phylum. Remember we said we have phylum Codata, comprising of organisms having a backbone, and these are the vertebrates. And also now here, in our case, we have phylum Arthropoda, which comprises of organisms without backbone, which are called now the invertebrates. And for this organism, which is organism M, so these organisms belongs now to phylum arthropoda, which are organisms without backbones, therefore they are called the invertebrates. So why did we say that these organisms belong, this organism belongs to phylum arthropoda? So he said that it belongs to phylum arthropoda because, first of all, it has jointed appendages. So appendages, head, thorax, abdomen. So you can see that his thorax and the abdomen are joined together, which is called cephalothorax. This is called jointed appendage, and by this it means that it is only organisms under phylum arthropoda which behave like that. Because for the insects also we see the head, thorax, and abdomen are joined together. That's why it's under the phylum arthropoda. So apart from that, you can see that also it has segmented bodies, which is now the head and the cephalothorax. Apart from that, you can also see that it possesses an exoskeleton in its body. So apart from that, you can also say that its body is bilaterally symmetrical. So bilaterally symmetrical, it means that, so like, for example, if we cut this organism like along the longitude, if we make a longitudinal section of this organism, so the left-hand side is going to, to look the same, same way as the right-hand side. So it is bilaterally symmetrical. Apart from that, you can also say that they possess an exoskeleton apart from uh, as well as an open circulatory system. So since they also possess open circulatory system, we can also conclude that this organism also is in phylum arthropoda. So the next bit of question is asking, about, is asking us about the class. So which class does this organism belong? So this organism simply belongs to class Arachnida. So why does it belong to class Arachnida? So the first reason is that it has four pairs of legs. So since it has four pairs of legs, that support that it is in class Arachnida. Apart from that, you can see that the body is only divided into two parts only, the head and the cephalothorax. Remember, cephalothorax is the thorax which has been fused with abdomen, which is now called the cephalothorax. Apart from that, you can see that it lacks antennae. So unlike other organisms, these organisms in class Arachnida, they do not possess antennae. So apart from that, we can also say that, uh, since you can also be able to see a cephalothorax, you can say that it is indeed in class Arachnida. So let's now go to question letter D. It's asking, name the type of skeleton found in organism labeled O. So for the organism O, remember organism O, that looks like a milliped. So organism O is a milliped. Why is it that organism O is a milliped? It's because... For this organism, we can only see two major body parts, which is the head and the trunk. Don't confuse it with the class Arachnida. Arachnida is head and the cephalothorax. For this milliped belonging to class Diplopoda, we only have the head and the trunk. So since we have head and the trunk, and then we have very many body parts, so that means that this one belongs to the class Diplopoda. 
So name the type of skeleton found in this specimen O. So the type of skeleton found in most organisms of class of Phylum Arthropoda is an exoskeleton. So most of the organisms in Phylum Arthropoda, they possess an exoskeleton. And since this milliped or organism O, which is in class Diplopoda, which is now the milliped, since it is also in Phylum Arthropoda, it must possess an exoskeleton, and that's why we have given our answer as it possesses an exoskeleton. So remember in the topic of reception, response, and coordination, not reception, support and movement in Form 4. So we dwelt through the different types of skeleton in that, in that last topic in Form 4, and we said that we have three different types of skeletons. For example, for the class Arthropoda that we have just discussed, they possess an exoskeleton. A skeleton which is found on the outside, but flesh is found on the inside. That is an exoskeleton. For human beings, for example, for most class mammalia and most organisms in phylum Chordata, the vertebrates, they possess an endoskeleton. So what is an endoskeleton? So for the endoskeleton, the skeleton is found inside the body and then the flesh is found on the outside of the body. That is an endoskeleton. And then finally we have a hydroskeleton or hydrostatic skeleton which is found on organisms like the earthworm. So this hydrostatic skeleton is just a fluid which keeps the body uh, or which gives the body its form. So this is a type of skeleton found in organisms like the earthworm, etc. So letter E is asking, name the class to which specimen N belongs. So name the class to which specimen N belongs. So specimen N, we can see that it is a fish. So which class do fishes belong? So fishes belong to class which is called the pieces. So pieces is the class to which the fish belong. So remember fish, uh, pieces is the class. Organism is the fish, the class is pieces. What about the phylum? So the phylum which fish belongs is called phylum chordata because the fish possesses a backbone. And since the fish has a backbone, therefore it will mean that it is a vertebrate. All vertebrates belong to phylum chordata and that's why fish also it belongs to now the phylum chordata. So Roman to which the last one is asking, give three reasons for your answer in D, Roman 1, above. So why did we say that this organism is a fish or it belongs to class which is class species? So it belongs to class species first of all because we see that it has fins. In the diagram you can see there is the presence of fins. Apart from the presence of fins, we can say that we can also see the scales which are drawn on the body of the fish. So since you can be able to see the scales there, this supports that this is from the class species because it is only the fish which possesses scales throughout its body. Apart from that, this organism also has a lateral line which is used to detect between the different impulses or the different stimuli found in water, be it touch, be it vibration, be it the temperature, be it the pH of the water body, etc. And then also we can say that there is also the presence of gills. So this organism also possesses gills which are found on the top side or on the front side of its body.